we need to understand two periods of time. You, you read in the Bible about the times of the Gentiles, right? And you also read about the fullness of the Gentiles. Now that's not talking about the same thing. They're two different things. The time of the Gentiles speaks of that time of world power in Gentile hands beginning with Nebuchadnezzar. The fullness of the Gentiles speaks more of the religious life of Israel, which began, and of the church, which began in in, uh, Christ establishing his church on earth, the day of Pentecost, when he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And what you need to understand is the manifestation of the kingdom of Christ has been postponed. Israel, what they were looking for was Christ to come and establish his kingdom on earth. And it would be like it was in the days of David. Those were the glory years for Israel, right? David and Solomon. Eighty years there when these two men reigned over Israel, that was a time of great prosperity. And shortly after Solomon, the kingdom divided, didn't it? And they never won, they never attained to that again But the prophet said, Messiah will come, he will sit on the throne of David, and he will bring back the glory of Israel. This will be the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, the millennial kingdom. Now that was postponed because Israel rejected their Messiah. And so the kingdom went underground, you might say. And we entered into the church age. And we're in the church age right now. I believe we're at the end of the church age. The coming of Christ is near at hand. The the rapture will take place. We will be raptured out. And then we'll enter into that seven year period of Jacob's trouble. When once again God is going to deal with Israel. And these seven parables speak of that church age. And we're given some understanding about how things will develop. Christ commanded his church now to carry on the work of the kingdom. The primary work is to win the lost, baptize them, and disciple them. That is our main work today. Now this first parable was given to answer that question. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. Now, here's our job. We are to share the Word of God. How will people respond to the Word of God? How will people respond to our witness? Why is it that so many people hear the gospel, and yet do not exercise saving faith? Now, we're responsible to proclaim the gospel, It's up to God to give the increase. We plant the seed, we water the seed, God gives the increase. God does the saving. Whether people will listen to us and obey the gospel, that's not our problem. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We just need to do our job of planting the seed of God's word in the hearts and minds of people. So let's look at this first parable. And Jesus represents here the reception of the gospel when it is planted in different types of soil. Chapter 13, verse 1. It says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and a whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell upon good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples said, Lord, why are you 
Why are you speaking in parables? And he goes on to explain that in a future message, I want to deal with that, uh, the, the need for the parables and why he taught in parables. But we'll look at that later. If you drop down to verse 18, Jesus gives the interpretation of this parable. Now, he doesn't do it for all of them. But he does give us an interpretation. Uh, we don't have to wonder what this parable is about. Jesus tells us exactly what this is about. So drop down to verse 18. He said, hear ye the... He's talking to his disciples privately now. He said, uh, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that receives the seed into stony places the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receives it. Yet hath he not rooted himself, but endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also receives seed among the thorns, is he that hears the word, and the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word, understands it, which also bears fruit, and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So he plainly tells us here what the parable is all about. So let's look at this. If you want to take notes, first of all, let's look at the seed. And note the symbolism of the seed. What does the seed represent? Jesus tells us it represents the word. It represents the word of God, the gospel, the word of the kingdom. Jot this verse down in your notes. 1 Peter 1.23 There it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So we are saved because we hear the word of God by faith. We act upon the gospel when we understand it. So the preaching of the word of God is likened to a farmer planting seeds in a field. And he expects a crop from that planting. He expects a harvest. And in so doing, when we plant the word of God in the hearts and minds of people, we hope to see a harvest come from that. And the harvest is souls being saved. People accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So we are to go forth bearing the precious seed. Right here it is. Go out and share the seed of God's Word. Share it with others that they might know the truth. So there's the symbolism and then secondly, the similarity of the seed. A seed has life in it. Do you know that? That seed has life in it. And the Word of God has life in it. Jesus said in John 6, 63, The words that I speak unto you are spirit, and they are life. There's life here in the Word of God. Write this verse down, Hebrews 4, 12. Hebrews 4, 12. There it says, for the Word of God is quick. That word quick means alive. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the Word of God. The Word of God has power to bring life and to transform lives. Was your life transformed by the Word of God? I hope so. It should be. I read about a medical doctor who once attended the Billy Graham crusade in London, England. He was an unbeliever. He sat with a stranger who was also an unbeliever. And they discussed uh, Billy Graham as they were waiting for the service to start. And, and neither one of them knew Billy Graham, and yet they were criticizing him. And, and they said, well, you know, he's just too flamboyant, and he's probably just in this for the money. And so that's how they talked. But as he began to preach, these two men listened. And the Spirit of God began to deal with them. When the invitation was given, the doctor said to his fellow critic, 
He said, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go forward and give my life to Jesus. The other man said, wait, I'm going with you. And by the way, here's your wallet. I picked your pocket. That's transformation. He gives the wallet back. He goes forward to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Two scoffers are transformed by the Word of God. Amen. And we love to see that, don't we? Hey, it's not the ability of the preacher. It's the power of God's Word. That's what makes the difference. Write this verse down. Isaiah 55, 11. God promises here, My word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. It's not going to come back void, is it? God goes with His word. The Holy Spirit works as we share it with others. So we look at the seed. Secondly, look at the sower. Look at the sower. Who is to sow the seed? Well, Jesus is the sower. He came and sowed the seed of God's word. But not only Jesus, but he says to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, if you've been born again, you are to be a sower. You are to sow the seed of God's Word whenever you have opportunity. Every one of us, male and female, rich and poor, young and old, educated and uneducated, we've been called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a field to plant. We talk about these missionaries who go to foreign fields to plant the seed of God's Word. We've got a home field here, don't we? We are responsible to go out into our neighborhoods, our community, our schools, and plant the seed. This is something, hey, this is not something we just do on Saturday on our visitation. This is something we do every day. Every day, look for an opportunity to sow the seed of God's Word. Share it with others. We have a field to plant. You say, well, preacher, why is it that so many churches have crop failures? They really don't have a harvest. They don't really see any conversions. Sometimes because the members refuse to do their job. We refuse to go out and plant the seed as we've been commanded. Folks, listen. Listen. There's got to be a seed time if there's ever going to be a harvest time. No farmer would expect a harvest if he did not plant the seed. And we cannot expect a harvest of souls if we're not out there planting the seed of God's Word. We've got to do it. Jesus lamented in Luke 10 too, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. There's few that are willing to go out and do this. Jesus sent out 70 disciples once, didn't he? Sent them out two by two. They went out throughout Judea, preaching the kingdom of Christ. That's what we try to do. Uh, I'd love for 70 to show up next Saturday. I would have a heart attack if that happened, but we've got that many here. Why can't we have 70 show up and go out two by two into our community and plant the seed of God's Word? Not only who is to sow the seed, but where are we to sow the seed? Everywhere. Everywhere. Amen? Everywhere we go. See, we're not just planting a patch in this church house. We're planting a lot of seed today. Amen? All over the building. That might do some good. There might be a couple lost people here that might get saved. I hope so. But folks, the great harvest is out there. There's the field. Your neighborhood is the field. Your classroom, your workshop. Wherever you're in contact with other people, you have an opportunity to sow the seed. And we're to broadcast it everywhere. You ever see the Back in the old times, they would have their sack of seed and they would just take it and they would just sling it everywhere. 
They call that broadcasting. They would plow the field and broadcast the seed everywhere. You'll see later on where the seed fell. D different kinds of ground it fell upon. But we're to share the gospel with everyone. Folks, there's, there's no shortage of seed. So we'll preach, we ran out of seed. No, you're never going to run out of seed. It's right here. There's no shortage of seed. There's a shortage of laborers. There's the problem. Get out and sow the seed. Don't get out and test the soil. We don't know who's going to be responsive to the gospel and who's not. In my years of ministry, I've discovered that sometimes I get surprised who gets saved. Sometimes I'm amazed at who doesn't. We're not to test the soil. We're to sow the seed. We're often wrong when we start judging others. I remember early in my ministry, first couple of years I was in the ministry, I went and helped one of my uncles in a revival meeting over in Alabama, Prattville, Alabama. And I told him, I said, Uncle Dalton, I'd love to come, but I want you to teach, because of all my uncles, he was the soul winner, Uncle Dalton. I said, Uncle Dalton, I want you to take me out soul winning. I want you to show me how you do it. And I learned a lot that week. We went to one house, he said, we pick up some kids here on Sunday, but he said, I've never really had a chance. The mother and grandmother live there, and I've never really had a chance to talk to them. Let's go by and see if we can catch them. We went by. They were home. Two of the most crude women I've ever met in my life. Vulgar, profane. And they, they were doing everything they could to try to embarrass us. They were succeeding. It didn't take me long to want to kick the dust off my shoes and go on. I said, these, these women are hopeless. I said that to myself. These women are hopeless. But Uncle Dalton went ahead and shared the gospel with them and led them both to the Lord. I thought, what in the world? Later on, he said, oh, Dwight, he said, they were just throwing up a big front uh, trying to intimidate us, but... You know, you can't let that stop you. Go ahead and plant the seed. I learned a big lesson there. Don't judge people. Don't judge people. Go ahead and share the gospel with everybody. Amen. Because usually our judgment's going to be wrong. Remember the parable of the Great Supper? Jesus defined the scope of the fields to be planted. It's in Luke 14, verses 21 through 23. There it says, go into the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Go to everybody. Go into your neighborhood, to your job, to your school. Do you like to gossip? Some of you look guilty. Hey, you know what? Gossip about Jesus. Amen. Just gossip about the Lord. Talk about Him all you want. That'll be good. Number three, let's look at the soil. And here's the main point of the parable. He's saying that when you share the gospel, here's the response you're going to get. He talks about four types of soil that the seed is planted in. Now look at these. First of all, there's the roadside soil. This speaks of the closed mind of the wayward secular hearer where the seed has no reception. When he's broadcasting the seed, there's hard pathways in, between, in the fields and where the people walk, and he's packed ground, a hard path. The seed does not penetrate, does it? And the birds come right along and they just pluck the seed off the top of the ground. And they said there's people like that. They're closed-minded. They will not listen. They are not interested in these things. He says the word is superficially received in this case. The traffic of this world has trodden down their hearts and made it hard. They're hard-hearted. You ever met those people? 
hardened by sin and rebelliousness. They don't want to hear the word of God. They have no interest at all in what you've got to say. There's a warning in the Bible, Hebrews 3, 7, and 8. There it says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. There's a warning. Don't harden your heart to the Word of God. Be receptive. Listen. It's sad that there are people who just flat out will not listen to what you have to say. They've closed their minds to these things. They don't want to talk about the Lord. We read about some of the Bible like that, don't we? Hard, hard, who do you think about? How about old Pharaoh? Pharaoh hardened his heart against God, didn't he? How about King Herod? He hardened his heart. Pilate hardened his heart. The Pharisees, many of them, hardened their hearts against the Word of God. Then you see the word satanically removed. The the devil's dirty birds come in and steal the word before it can penetrate their heart. You try to witness to them, they're too busy. They don't have time to hear you. They'll even lie to try to get rid of you. And and they'll gloat later about it. Boy, I sure got rid of him, didn't I? And they think they've accomplished something. They act like they've won a victory, but they didn't. They're going to die and go to hell. I heard about a backslidden father who didn't go to church, didn't take his children to church, and the pastor visited him, was trying to talk to him, and and the father just kind of mocked the pastor and mocked the church. The pastor left. And that boy's... man's little boy standing there. He'd listened to all this. He looked at his daddy and says, we don't believe in that old Jesus, do we? And it broke the man's heart to hear his son say that. We don't believe in that old Jesus, do we? God used that to break his heart and get him back in church, get his family back in church. Hey, be careful. What you say around those kids. Be careful how you criticize the pastor and criticize the church and criticize things in front of your children. You know what's going to happen? They're going to grow up and not go to church. Because all they've ever heard growing up was criticism. They say, I'm not going to waste my time going to church. Parents, be careful. Be very careful about how you speak in front of your children. They're listening. They're listening. Then there's the rocky soil. By the way, I had a verse here. Let me, let me give you this. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. Talking about these birds who come along and steal the word. That's the activity of Satan. And it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded. Now the God of this world is not God, it's the devil, right? He's called the God of this world. He hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Sometimes when you're witnessing, the old devil shows up, doesn't he? Matt, Brian, and I were witnessing to a young man last week. Got got to the point of sealing the deal, and his dad opened the door. The old devil... Said the dad in there said, You better get out there and stop this. Your son's about to get saved. Amen. But we ignored dad and kept witnessing and led the young man to the Lord. How many times have you ever done it? You're witnessing and, and something happens to, to hinder what you're trying to do. Hey, that's the devil. He's trying to rob that which you're trying to plan in the hearts of people you're witnessing to. Don't let him win the victory. The second soil is the rocky soil. This speaks of the clouded mind of the weak, superficial hearer where the seed has no root. You see their initial response. This is not, I mean, this is just a shallow layer of soil on a bed of rock. These are people, they hear the gospel, 
They're even moved by it. Emotionally, they, they may weep and feel some, some remorse over the sin in their life. And they may, they may make some profession of faith, but because there was no actual repentance on their part, there was no real change of heart and mind, no forsaking of sin, it doesn't last long. It's shallow. Now, there's nothing wrong with showing emotion. Amen? Nothing wrong with being emotional. But many are very superficial about their commitment to Christ. Very superficial. And you see that. They make a profession of faith. They may even get baptized. You put them in water, they sizzle and disappear. What do we call those? Alka-Seltzer Christians. I've seen a few of those here. We baptize them and then they're gone. We never see them again. Or they may come for a little while and then they disappear. I think these are superficial believers and their faith is superficial and it doesn't last. Many have made professions of faith. They seem to be sincere at the time. They express sorrow for sin. They express joy for salvation. But something happens. There's no root to their faith. And by and by, they are offended and dropped by the wayside. You've seen that, haven't you? What is it that makes people think that God excuses them from coming to church because they got offended? You'd be amazed how many people are sitting at home right now and they're not in church because somebody offended them. Let me give you a verse on that. Psalm 119, 165. Underline this, highlight this in your Bible. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, the word of God, and nothing shall offend them. See that? You folks that are so easily offended, do you see that? If you get into the Word of God like you ought to, nothing's going to offend you. You're going to remain steadfast, no matter what anybody might say. The third soil is what we call the ruined soil. This speaks of the cluttered mind of the worldly sinful hearer where the seed has no room to grow. This is a soil that's it's not hard, it's not shallow, but the seed is choked to death by weeds and thorns. Any farmer or gardener knows you've got to clean out the weeds and the thorns to have a good crop. Amen? You understand that? Now there are many people who hear the gospel, they accept it, they make a profession of faith, but they do not deal with the sin in their lives, and so it becomes unfruitful their worldliness chokes off the word from having any effect in their life listen the average church has many of these members people like Demas remember Demas who was with the apostle Paul part of his missionary team and Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 10 Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world Worldliness choked off his fruitfulness. And you see that so much in our day and time today. Worry destroys the seed. Worldliness destroys the seed. The Bible says, Colossians 3, 2, set your affections on things above, right? Not on things on the earth. Be heavenly minded. But many will not heed this. And instead of, some people, instead of pulling the weeds in their life, they just seem to fertilize it. Amen. They're not dealing with it. They're just doing things to make it even worse. Now the fourth soil is the rich soil. This speaks of the committed mind of a willing, sincere hearer where the seed has no rejection. 
the good ground that receives the seed and bears much fruit. These are people that are born again. There's a transformation that takes place in their life. They turn away from the old life and they begin to walk a new life. They are faithful. They are rooted and grounded in the faith. Now of all that hear the gospel, how few there are that really bear this kind of fruit. Jesus himself preached to the multitudes, but only a few followed him. Do you know that? Only a few were really faithful disciples of Christ. And it's true today. You see, the word comprehendingly received into the life and the word consequently reproduced in the life. Matter of fact, Brother Cliff and I were out knocking doors yesterday and we met these different types of soil. We met a Buddhist who had no interest in anything we had to say. Her so-called Christian husband, they were sitting on the porch. Brother Cliff and I went up and started talking with them. There was a little Buddha statue right there. (laughs) The husband acted like he'd never seen it before. You know, I pointed it out and he said, where'd that come from? He said, now listen, as we were trying to talk to his wife, he said, you know, we don't talk religion here. And I thought, yeah, that's smart. Just let your wife die and go to hell. He's supposed to be the Christian, the believer. And he's not concerned about his wife being lost and on her way to the devil's hell. And you'd be amazed how many people out there are just like that. I imagine the husband needs a good dose of salvation himself. Probably the problem. Just because he calls himself a Christian doesn't mean he's been saved. We met a Buddhist. Then we knocked on the door. There's good seed, good, good soil. We talked to a young man just moved there from Muskogee a member of a Baptist church there looking for a church. Had a really good visit with him. He said, we're going to come visit y'all. We're looking for a church just like that. We went two doors down and got the door slammed in our face. Man opened the door. I said, I'm Pastor West from Florence Street Baptist Church. No, thank you. I said, you're not welcome. That doesn't happen a lot, but every once in a while, door gets slammed in your face. I can handle that. I mean, that's the most persecution we have to endure. But what I'm saying, you go out there and you're going to meet these different souls, these different types of people. Jesus wants you to know this so that you won't get discouraged when somebody slams the door in your face. Don't get discouraged and quit. Expect that to happen because there's people out there like that. But you keep on trucking Because you're going to find some of that good soil that's ready to listen and will accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. It makes it all worthwhile. Amen. You know, I'm distressed by the closed-minded hearer. I'm disappointed by the clouded-minded hearer. I'm discouraged by the cluttered-minded hearer. But man, I'm delighted by the committed, faithful hearer. They they make the ministry a joy. People who are saved and baptized and get into church and are faithful and bear good fruit. We don't all bear the same amount of fruit. Some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. You see that. Some are more committed, more fruitful than others. But that fourth group makes the ministry worthwhile. I thank God for those of you who fall in that category. You might ask yourself, what type of soil am I? Are you hard-hearted? Are you shallow-hearted? Are you of a divided heart? Or do you have a receptive heart, willing to accept the Word of God? Now, sometimes the problem is unproductive soil. Some places are harder to evangelize than others. But I think the biggest problem is unwilling sowers. 
unwilling sowers. And I want to challenge you this morning. Members of Florence Street Baptist Church, let's be faithful in sowing the seed. The, har the, the law of harvest is found in Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Listen to this. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless, see that word doubtless? He shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's a promise from God. He said, if you'll do it, I'll bless you. I'll bless the planting of the seed. The more seed we plant, the greater harvest we can expect. 